technology begins with uh, a promise of liberty and prosperity. And liberty, I call, with a sort of a highfalutin term, ontological liberty, not political liberty. Uh, ontological liberty is the liberty from the burdens of reality. This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens, with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community-oriented. Our guest today is Albert Bargman, a philosopher and writer whose research interests intersect technology, society, and culture. Albert's theory, The Device Paradigm, and his book, Technology and the Character of Contemporary Life, are foundational contributions to the philosophy of technology. Our conversation with Albert focuses on the philosophy of technology. What does philosophy of technology even mean, and why is it relevant? Why does technology obscure, abstract, and conceal? We cover these questions as well as Albert's theory of technology, the device paradigm, minimalism, the human condition, and the perils and promises of technology. You've made very significant contributions to the area of philosophy of technology. A natural starting point might be, what does philosophy of technology mean? Why is it relevant? Well, philosophy of technology in the widest sense would be reflecting on what it is, what the impact of it is on, on our culture. And the predominant view is the instrumentalist view. And there's a classic quotation from... Andy Grove, who was the longtime CEO of Intel. And he says, technology happens. It's not good. It's not bad. It's still good or bad. When, whenever prominent people talk about technology, that's the view they take. It's the instrumentalist view. So technology is value neutral in and of itself. And you can use it well, you can use it poorly. And then uh, there is a much more incisive and illuminating view because the instrumentalist view clearly fails to answer the question, what's the impact of all those instruments? And the determinist view made prominent first by Jacques Ellul in the technological society takes a rather dark view of what technology does to us, alienates from one another, from nature, from uh, engagements. And the problem with the determinist view is that people like Elul and Heidegger sometimes think that we have no agency. Technology is just is so powerful, it determines what we do. It's insightful, but it's wrong. And so the third view, the one that I advocate for, I call the paradigmatic view. And it says that we should think of technology as a pattern of taking up with reality. It has really very worrisome aspects. The major point is that 
we have to become aware of it in its cultural force, uh, discuss it, and then reform it. So these would be the three major views from a philosophical point of view in a broad sense, determinist, instrumentalist, and paradigmatic. It, it feels like for every, I guess, era of human existence, I think that era thought that yeah. you know, their existence was kind of the most important, if you will. And how do you think about this idea of relevance as well? Has philosophy of technology ever been more relevant than now? No, but technology in a sort of historical, all-encompassing sense that is using artifacts to cope with the world was woven into the culture, say, the Blackfeet culture of our Native American friends and predecessors. And it was the technology that in the hunting and gathering culture was admirable, very skillful, very aware of the world, uh, very aware of one another. And when technology became industrialized, technology tore this fabric apart and then entrusted pieces to different agencies and uh, industry, administration, government. The fabric of life has been torn apart ever since. And it's hard today to live a life that's as coherent and rewarding and skillful as the Blackfeet life. In that sense, what's been your personal relationship with technology? My personal? Yeah, your personal. <laughs> I'm uh, a minimalist. I'm grateful, of course, for the good things, the medical technology, communication technology, which allows us to talk this morning. But I'm minimalist, so I don't have television. My late wife, she passed away in 2009. And our three children never had television, which was really good for them. They were very fine scholars and athletes, musicians. Now I keep it to a minimum. I don't have television still. I don't participate in uh, social media. And I don't have a smartphone. I just have a flip phone. <laughs> and of course... As I said, I'm grateful for this, but I'm trying to keep it to a minimum. Pretty sure that's a personal choice you took. And yeah. a conscious one. Yeah, right. Tell us what your thought was when you were taking that choice, or you've made such choices. I always sort of practiced that life, and it came to me as an issue in the late 1960s, one of the spurs was an article by um, the author of uh, The Supper of the Lamb. It made me realize how fruitful and rewarding this communal hands off traditional way of life is. So I, and then there <laughs> was a little bit of uh, a professional ambition and arrogance in it. I was young. <laughs> and I thought, I'm, I'm going to take on the most important <laughs> subject there is. <laughs> it was technology. So then I began writing about it and, and building on it and trying to uh, put all the things that I knew into uh, a theory. Technology and then I finally published a Technology and the Character of Contemporary Life in 1984. And so it took me roughly uh, 10 years, 12 years to uh, get clear about this and make it more than observations and essays and intuitions, but a theory. Because a theory 
highlights things in a way, in a coherent and encompassing way that essays don't. So, you know, then philosophers, I guess, are inclined towards theory anyway. You made very significant contributions to, again, the philosophy of technology, and you have um, shown this rare ability to describe subtle and nebulous, complex ideas and issues as eloquent language that can facilitate understanding and sort of building off of that four different ways to define technology from a philosophical lens. What I was confronted with was the determinist view, which is profound but wrong, the instrumentalist view, which is correct but superficial. So I tried to find a theory that I was hoping would be insightful and true. There were people I learned from Jacques Ellul and Martin Heidegger. The paradigmatic view is best explained and recently, recently being the last 10 years, found a very helpful entry into the paradigmatic view of philosophy, the term commodification. It's helpful because commodification is a well-known, well-used term. Uh, there is uh, an obvious and important definition of it, and that is simply to draw something from outside the market into the market and make it available for purchase and sale. The cultural or philosophical notion overlaps with it, but points out what happens to a community when something is commodified. And what happens is that the holistic texture of that community gets its first care when, uh, say, to take bread, a factory takes over bread baking, then the entire culture of bread gets lost. And with it, skills, understandings, engagements in a pre-technological setting is still found around the world, but not in the advanced industrial countries. In that setting, people know everything there is to know about bread. They know it comes from wheat, wheat, right? And they know what is involved in growing wheat. And at harvest time, everybody has to chip in and help getting the stuff in the granary. They know that from there it goes to the miller, from the miller to the baker. Many cases, and in, in my way, the ideal case, the flour goes to homesteads. And the women, of course, <laughs> are always the, the, main, the mainstay of a family as an economic and cultural institution. Make the loaves, and then uh, someone during the night heated the communal oven. And uh, they all bring it to the oven, and there it gets baked. And so bread is considered sacred because you know what all goes into it and how crucial it is in sustaining life. I grew up in the Black Forest, and there's a, a legend of a princess, and to show that the princess was a really, really bad person. <laughs> she is said to have taken loaves, hollowed them out, and used them for shoes. It's this uh, abuse of, of something sacred that is illustrated that way. Now you can also see that people, uh, at least in part, are restoring the the fullness of the experience of bread at least in part by through local bakeries and they when they go and buy their loaves they can see the ovens they get to know the people 
uh, sometimes the bakery says, this is uh, Montana wheat. <laughs> Pay attention to the wheat fields that you uh, see, especially on the uh, central part of uh, Montana. So there's the bad news where bread is just wasted and disregarded and, uh, and then renewal, which is, can never be total, of course, but can be powerful. I guess the entry point of commodification is, I think, illuminating in some sense. How about the viewpoint of technology as sort of an input-output scheme where you have a certain set of inputs, you yeah. apply to yeah. Yeah. Right. Outputs, and then yeah. that creates a different output and often that yields, a, yields an increased productivity. How about that lens? When the input-output tie was broken in the experience of people, not, of course, physically. Physically, there always has to be some tie. There were gains that were heavily advertised by the companies who made the input part invisible and the output part very prominent. And this uh, Wonder Bread, for instance, sure, you've ever uh, bought or eaten it. But the idea was to make it <laughs> the ideal bread, you know, nice and fluffy on the inside and then a <laughs> thin crust on the outside and people were made to think, this is really wonder wonderful bread. You know, there was a brand called Wonder Bread. On the output side, there were, in some cases, real gains for people, and in others, just terrible cultural losses. So there are gains, but none of them outweighs the fabric wholeness and, and integrity of the fabric of life. But now it's inevitable. We don't have a choice, so we have to uh, make the best within technology it would be irresponsible to try and throw it all away. And the people who do, I mean, in the advanced industrial countries, they're just parasites, you know, because they have a homestead in upper New York state, you know, and grow their own food, blah, blah, blah. They have, of course, a car that they don't take responsibility for. They have medical facilities that they don't take responsibility for. So I, I, I don't have much admiration for that kind of counter to technology. Is the do-it-yourself revolution kind of hinting towards going back to the basics? The DIY revolution, if you will. Is that a human answer to the commoditization and loss of relationship Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the, the most important part is what I call the culture of the table. I think the culture of the table in this country, as you know, it's the evening meal. That's the great meal. And to make communally, the entire family should work on it, not just leave it to the women, but to make it yourself. And then go back with the ingredients as far down as you can. So you may be able to grow your own vegetables and uh, you may get things from the farmer's market and you get to know the people, you know, where they grow this stuff. And then you actually make that dinner and sit down. No screens, of course. That's a wonderful experience and one that has the benefit not only of positively countering the culture of technology, but it's also one that is universal. Everybody has to eat. Sitting down to dinner and, and uh, consuming a meal that all of the people in the household have made, that's just a very restorative experience. So I'm very much advocating for it, and especially in, in my Church, I'm an Episcopalian. I tell my fellow Episcopalian 
cheating on your wife is bad, but not having an evening meal is worse. Would just really like to hear your reaction to this idea of technology as an abstraction. It goes well with uh, the notion of uh, commodification, especially cultural commodification. It's in a way an abstracting, right? A pulling away of one thing from its context. And then it's an abstraction that uh, is all pervasive. People don't see it. And it's not in all cases equally uh, injurious. But uh, social media is just one big enterprise of abstraction, right? You abstract from the normal and fruitful interaction of real people just an aspect. And, and then, you know, what's even more remarkable is self-abstraction, right? People present themselves on social media in a way that uh, is not them. They have sort of abstracted from, from their life and, and then presented. An abstraction happens in medicine. So a lot of medicine where health is just thought to be a physical state that the physician is responsible for. But quite often the physician doesn't say, so how are things going? You don't look happy or well to me, <laughs> right? And, and that holistic way you find it quite often, but not often enough, I don't think, is a way of, of abstracting, you know, so you can make a connection with uh, between abstraction and uh, cultural commodification. And then you see how it impoverishes life, sort of dilutes it. We've spoken about technology. How do you relate software, hardware, computing in terms of technology? What do you think that, that relationship is? It's uh, patterned and haunted by a terrible asymmetry. And the asymmetry is between the people who make the technology possible and the people who consume it. And the people who make it possible are highly skilled and inventive and resourceful people. You know, so all the stuff that's gone into the screen <laughs> that you see, you know, how fine-grained it is and uh, there's no lag and uh, the sound is all right. That took incredible and cooperative efforts. But th there's a thing called social causality. What is not the individual case like ours and <laughs> the three of us think, of course, highly of ourselves <laughs> in, in our use of it. But social causality asks, what's the overall effect on people? And that's not skillful at all. On the contrary, uh, the asymmetry is such that the people who make it make it more accessible. So the intelligence that goes into the construction goes along with the stupefaction of people. You don't have to go through the iOS, you know, to find a connection. And uh, the Part of the expertise is to make it more intuitive and uh, easier. And then, of course, to make the available opportunities more colorful and more diverse. In that aspect, I guess the creators will say that they're trying to make life easier so that you can do more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was a, a, a cartoonist, uh, I forget his name, he, he doesn't draw cartoons anymore, but one of them was very telling. And uh, there's a family, 
uh, sitting on, on the couch and staring at a blank wall. <laughs> and uh, the uh, caption is, uh, life before television. And it's so funny because it pretends to, it shows what people pretend to think. And that is, well, I was just an addition to my life. And they don't ask, what, what has it replaced? And, and uh, whenever one thing comes in, something else has to go, except for material stuff that goes into the garage and <laughs> into these micro uh, storage faci facilities that crop up everything, you know, and we're sort of choking on stuff. And it's really somewhere between deplorable and funny. I think a lot of the conversation so far has focused on uh, the implications of technology on a human level. And, and that is tremendously important. The effects, secular effects on culture and just social fabric, like you've pointed out quite um, crisply. You've written quite a bit about information technology. So I'm curious to hear if you have any further to, to add on this topic in terms of sort of situating these concepts and the interrelationship between software, hardware, computing. There are again, the two strands of the construction of it, which is just admirable. Nothing in human history has that precision, that complexity, this uh, microstructure. But uh, in the social causality, it detaches us more and more from reality. And the next phase, which surprisingly hasn't <laughs> worked out well culturally and commercially so far as uh, total virtual reality, which is sort of the end point when uh, the three of us wouldn't even need a chair, a screen or whatever. We just put on the helmet and, and dial up uh, our uh, partners in conversation. And then, of course, I think, unfortunately, pornography is the, might be the driver that will uh, drive it forward but sort of in the logical progression there is something compelling right uh, reality becomes less and less important until you can dispense with it altogether in anything you'd want to add around the nature of technology what i would add is that uh, there are worries about technology just this morning i heard a segment on NPR about uh, satellites that the Chinese are lofting up and uh, they can't will be able to trace people. And so there are questions about privacy, about national security, and those worries about technology are important. We expect our government to keep us safe, to protect our privacy, and to make it equally available and people get upset when some rural village school in Montana doesn't have broadband and they're willing to donate a lot of money to make it happen. And But this has the tendency of uh, obscuring the deeper question. So we're all worried about, as we should be, about security, privacy, national security. But then we think, okay, that's it. <laughs> We're taking care of technology. And it's sort of uh, a general feature of technology never to oppose anything, but to say, oh, you've got a problem. We've got a solution. Oh, you feel isolated at home. And, uh, well, <laughs> let's construct <laughs> social media. And, uh, oh, and that's just, I heard a segment where somebody discovered the area in the brain that makes you fall in love and then uh, brokenhearted if your partner goes away. And, and the promise is, well, we can help people uh, to just forget about brokenheartedness. You know? And, and uh, that's 
uh, just again another abstraction that just strikes me as stupid. You know, I mean, if you're broken hearted, there is a solution, and the solution is that your lover comes back, right? Um, and uh, if the lover doesn't come back, then it's something you have to work through. And you don't want to go to a physician and say, well, just my broken-hearted part of the brain, and I'll be over my partner. So that's just part of the amazing ignorance of what's really happening through technology, combined always with the promise of wonderful new things that will make life easier. Thank you. And this is something I guess you've been alluding to a bit also. How would you describe human relationship with technology? Could you speak more to it? Yeah, we're in it and it's inescapable. And uh, I've written a piece titled uh, The Force of the Wilderness Within the Ubiquity of uh, Cyberspace. The only reason that we thankfully can escape it is by not having the organ that we don't have, which that responds to what's always out there, and it's a smartphone. The wonderful thing is that we can refuse to have that organ with us, or we can constrain it in some way, but uh, it's just everywhere. And now, of course, now there's also a issue of of uh, global justice and philosophy. Um, technology goes through stages. The first ones are painful. The middle ones are constructive, and uh, the final ones that we're in are degenerate. And you should see to it that the uh, third world countries, the poor countries, get. The middle part, which is constructive, right? Clean water from a utility connection, either through satellite or wires and so on. But uh, the line between the constructive and the degenerate is fuzzy. And so, <laughs> and, and the front is not even, right? The degenerate parts come <laughs> very quickly in the form of uh, iPhones. And uh, some of the constructive parts uh, lag behind, such as uh, medical technology. So we have to learn to see, to distinguish the phases and promote the ones that are need to be promoted, promoted and the ones that are degenerate and need to be met with skepticism <laughs> and reform. I guess it's the preservation of human relationship that aces everything is what I, I learned from you. Right. I mean, we always find ourselves within a physical setting. And the physical setting sort of or digs channels into our lives that we fall into or have to follow. And there, again, are implications for the well-being of society that are, there are essayists and commentators who do uh, notice them. So a good thing about public transportation is not only that it's good for the environment, but it's good because you see people who are different from you, right? And uh, they give you an opportunity to to be good, you know, get up and give a pregnant woman your seat or greet a person, say there's a, a black person among lots of white people, and, and you make an effort to say hi to that person and even offer your seat if that's appropriate. And if people are change into their individual cars, then it's all gone. And in some cases, you have to use a car and the interstate highway system, you know, that's just impossibly <laughs> complex and artful, you know, 
like these spaghetti bowls, but then you pay the price of a loss of connection. You uh, lose it also if your uh, commute is uh, two hours each way. You're not spending that time with your family, and uh, it's not particularly good for your mental health, right? <laughs> which leads to road rage. If you are on a hike in the, on some trail in the uh, Rocky Mountains and you meet another person, you inevitably say, hi, how is it going? Where did you camp? Uh, and there's good feeling. And uh, the fabric of society needs these little knittings together to do well. And we're sort of systematically eliminating the need for those meetings. I call these the enforcers of virtue <laughs> in, in a traditional life. The enforcers of virtue were powerful. You just had to be punctual. You had to work hard. You have, <laughs> you thought twice before you would tell your wife, Hey, honey, I'm out of here. <laughs> And uh, these, and we have the wrong kinds of enforcers. Therefore, we people do value, and we should reform the physical setting so that these encounters are encouraged. And you may are you familiar with the new urbanism where they built these houses where you can't have a car on the street, and they all have porches, and you know, and they get to know each other, look, look out for each other's children, and then ideally they can walk to the post office, they can walk to the store, and in walking, you know, they take in the neighborhood. So there is uh, awareness, and I think the role of philosophy should be to put this in context through a theory. So that's what I've been trying. <laughs> Not very successfully. I, I, so I reached you, Eric and Sachin, so. There you go. So if we think about the human to technology relationship in the context of the notion of control. Yeah, yeah. And right. then we think about time and, and history as well. How has that evolved over time historically? Who has sort of had the upper hand, if you will? historically, and, and how do you see that changing? The longest period of human culture is the hunting and gathering phase. And it was like, who knows, 300,000, 400,000 or more years. And the hunting and gathering culture had a division of labor, but it was uh, cooperative. And the women who gathered the huckleberries were no less respected for doing that than the men who went out and hunted deer or buffalo. And they were admired for their ability to tan buffalo robes, make them into tents. And then patriarchy, which I think is just the terrible curse on human culture, arose in different ways and under different circumstances. It's been a, anger, I think, is a burden that men carry and not very well at all. Male anger is just a terribly destructive force. And patriarchy sort of sanctions it and encourages it. There are different ways in which control is exercised. It's exercised from one human to another. And, and then, of course, it's exercised by nature, right? Nature makes, controls where the Blackfeet would winter, right? So not out in the prairies, but in the shelter of the woods and a valley. The Blackfeet were already patriarchal, although not as destructively so as patriarchies and in the culture at large and changing, thank God, but very late 
you know, with uh, women's equality and uh, women's rights and so on. With respect to our ability to control or let's say control technology, do you, do you feel like that has diminished over time? So if we go back yeah, yeah. into the past, we were able to sort of tame fire, we were able to create tools for ourselves, but technology really didn't take over our minds in the same way as it does today. Yeah, so need to make a distinction between the control that we're subject to, but that is inevitable and that we should support. We have to learn to control carbon dioxide emissions. We have to control and to prevent the extinction of species. And then, of course, there's the civic control that's much in discussion uh, of the police and, and people rightly and, and I think fruitfully are thinking about how we should learn to control uh, situations where a mentally disturbed person is in trouble or gets other people in trouble and so on. So that's the good control, the inevitable control that we should monitor and and improve, and I think we're doing that. And then there's the pseudo control of the consumer, right? And, and the internet is uh, like a fairy tale, you know, because you can summon everything at an instant, uh, no matter where from. Uh, so, such, and you can summon the country of your origin and. Uh, and there may be cameras that uh, show you what the traffic in your hometown and, and things like that. That's easy, right? And uh, it gives people a control that requires no discipline and no skill and therefore can have terrible consequences on, on a person's uh, mental health and on the good life that the person should lead. You spoke about uh, instrumentalism, technology, determinism, and then you've also written about device paradigm. Could you speak to each one of these three aspects and then how they may relate to each other they are based on your perspective to characterize technology. True. And, and again, these things versus devices are just part of the theory and fit into the theory and make things, the hope is that they make the fog lift. People see that things and devices are very different. And then again, using theory, a thing discloses a world, whereas a device obscures it and hardens and promotes the distinction between the surface of people's lives and, and the background that they don't understand. Devices are, whereas things are world disclosing devices are world obscuring or concealing. So people have no idea at all, you know, how a screen works, how it is that these pixels have become finer and finer and are now invisible and convey uh, motion. And, and education should and could lift some of the concealment of devices. But in everyday life, they're inevitably opaque. And that's just, they conceal. So it's the opposite of world disclosure. And uh, devices are also unstable. One device, a device always 
connects machinery and commodity. The, the machinery may change radically. The commodity is just improved in degree. The basic uh, changes in, in the machinery. And I'm sure that you and Eric in your uh, professional life see how uh, procedures and computers and everything else changes in profound ways. But the output is always the same, but the improvement of the machineries sort of enhance the outcome and, uh, you know, you're <laughs> getting praise and raises if you help, you know, the, uh, the changing the uh, machinery that's invisible to most people and produce uh, a more lucrative commodity. The device paradigm kind of speaks about this abstraction happening. Yes, exactly. Right. The uh, device abstracts a commodity from its context, and the machinery has a certain self concealing tendency, uh, most notably, of course, in the visual information technology, right? The old. <laughs> Television sets were just a big piece of furniture with this little screen. And then following the screen, you see how the commodity becomes more and more prominent and the machinery more and more concealed. In fact, there, there is a, I don't know what I should call that picture that you find on the media following the development of uh, mobile phones. Right, and, and the initial one is as big as a brick. <laughs> That's very little. And then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller till it comes to the limit where you can't make it any smaller because <laughs> then you, you can't use it anymore, right? You can't make an iPhone as big as a, a pillbox or whatever. The machinery sort of conceals itself more and more and the commodity becomes more and more prominent. I think it's a pattern that's found in in many cases uh, in different versions. And again, the idea of making the distinction is to allow people to see the same thing that they thought were very different. The change from the village fountain where all the women gathered and then when that was replaced by the the device of public water system and utility that's the same thing as when you know a brick like thing uh, ends as a as an iphone or a smartphone so the the distinction makes us aware of how oh, pervasive and powerful technology has been, but also it points out how we can sort of shift the the cultural weight away from devices more towards things. And does this relate more to the technology determinism than an instrument? How to think about that? The instrumental view conceals the increasing prominence of devices. Uh, determinists are well aware of what devices do to us, uh, alienation of one another. Marx already saw that well, and uh, they make it seem as though, <laughs> you know, there's an optimistic view of determinism and a pessimistic one, and the optimistic one. A, get with it or let, or become irrelevant, you know. And the pessimistic says, oh, wow, we're just uh, rushing towards misery and there's nothing we can do about it. And then so the paradigmatic view, the idea is to introduce distinctions that uh, help people to see that we're not helplessly surrendered to technology and that there is a direction 
of reform that's open. What was the, I guess, was there an aha moment for you in conceiving this notion of the device paradigm, your theory of technology? How did the pieces come together? The uh, discussion that made me see the path towards the device paradigm was functionalism. And functionalism makes a distinction between function and structure and uh, played a big role. And it does it to this day, although not under this particular terminology in artificial intelligence. And uh, the function is intelligence. And the structure doesn't matter as long as it produces intelligence. And so you get these people like Kurzleben, who uh, badly wants to migrate from his interior writing body into uh, a nice computer. And it's functionalism in that there's a thing, intelligence, that's the function. And then there are structures, and the structures are variable. And uh, at the time it was used, in the mind-body discussion and then the artificial intelligence, you know, which was way back. And, and so the device paradigm combines the two, calling the function the commodity and uh, the uh, structure of the machinery. In this terminology, it's more widely and I think more accessibly uh, available. Let's talk about the impact of the application of technology on three different levels, an individual level, society and, and uh, culture. And just how do you think about the impact of technology on those three kind of levels? One way of seeing the three connected is by way of embedding and uh, Embeddedness is uh, a term that uh, social theorists have used for a long time. The individual is embedded in the technology. That is, the way we understand ourselves, the way we move, is determined by, to a large extent, and for most people in the advanced industrial countries, by technology. And then technology is embedded in the culture because it's uh, not just a problem that becomes available and visible at the social or societal level. You have to go deeper. The deeper level is where you come to see that all of society is embedded in the culture of technology. Reform requires that we make the pivot of reform not in the individual. And it has, in, in that sense, uh, a great kinship with environmentalism. If I collect all my aluminum cans and recycle all my paper, yay. <laughs> And if I, if I buy, give up on my Forester and buy a, a Prius, yay. But that's not enough, right? The uh, reform has to be raised or deepened to the level of society so that society uh, promotes electrical vehicles and, and sees to it that the electricity uh, needed for the propulsion of the electric vehicles is uh, generated in an environmentally uh, sustainable way, solar or wind. And that's great, but you can live a life of consumption in an, in an environmentalist way, right? You just always use the stuff and the entertainment and the goodies that are environmentally defensible. We have to do more. The good life is something that 
we not only need to live, but something that we feel responsible for to the culture that we live in. We have to try to bring about reforms that are conducive to the good life. And again, there are uh, steps taken in that direction. I've mentioned urbanism, the new urbanism, farmers markets, and then the whole artisan economy, which is slowly <laughs> growing, is a way of, uh, it's a way in which a new culture is struggling to be born. And just one point on, on that, you know, you know this, of course, very well. You studied the implications of technology on a societal level and culture adapts over time. It adapts to its time and often young generations are drivers of that. Culture is changing rapidly as we speak, much because of technology. But that has also happened across history. And, and maybe someone 500 years ago also felt like the future was moving into the wrong direction. Maybe share a little bit more around why, you know, far farmers markets are so important. It seems to me that you're really focused on the human connectedness. That's sort of the essence of, of the argument. Just maybe speak a little bit about, you know, why it's not necessarily that it's the culture that's changing that's bad, but, but more of the, the root of that being less human, I guess, connectivity. Yeah, first of all, our culture is functioning when it isn't, as in Texas right now, you know, and everybody's cold and without power. We think that's terrible. They, they should have done this, something about that before. We should be grateful that the culture is functioning. What I find both hopeful and a, and a little disappointing is that there are so many different things in which our culture is reforming within an overall context of technology. And uh, so what I have in mind is the artisan economy, of course, you know, where people make furniture and do ceramics and build instruments and so on. But then also the bicycle culture. You know, there are people who just love to bicycle and go on tours. There are organizations like Adventure Cycling that help people to uh, construct itineraries. And then there are the runners, right, who run not just for health reasons, so they wouldn't be caught dead on a treadmill. They want to run outside and experience the nature. There are the skiers. They're the gardeners, and uh, all these things are so hopeful. But at the same time, what distresses me is that these people don't know of, of each other, that they don't combine. And so their political force of, of this new culture is close to zero. What's needed is that they all work together and then work politically by endorsing candidates and promoting legislation and so on. That takes organization, which in part can rely on prior organizations, you know, like adventure cycling and running clubs and so on. And it's mostly young people, right? <laughs> the ones who are out there, they lead lives of engagement. They have a focal practice that sustains them. There are different kinds of focal things. It would be a, a violin, you know, it could be a garden, it could be the combination of a, a really fine touring cycle and the paths that are now being built, right, for bicycles. There's a need for them to see each other. And as I said, a good theory would help to um, smooth the way 
And then once the culture becomes organized, it can uh, exert considerable political power that it would have. That's just a little <laughs> despondent that all that good stuff is out there, <laughs> but doesn't get critical mass. In that sense, what do you feel are the perils and promise that technology holds for humans? And related to that, if there is a technologist creating some technology, how do you think that technologists should think when they are creating this technology? Yeah. Technology begins with uh, a promise of liberty and prosperity. And liberty, I call with a sort of a highfalutin term, ontological liberty, not political liberty. Uh, ontological liberty is the liberty from the burdens of reality and the burdens of hunger, of sickness, of pandemics, of being cold. And then prosperity is uh, being blessed with all the good things that sort of are the counterpart of the uh, pre-liberty situation, you know, furniture and a bedroom for the parents and a bedroom for the children and things like that. And it's a real and honorable and promise and then a promise that was not empty. It has been fulfilled in many ways. But then uh, the slide from there is a slide from the constructive phase to the generate phase, and that happened in this country in 1950. We should have stayed uh, in our consumption and in our demands and reality at something like that level. Most of the things uh, have been improved for the middle and upper class, uh, I think, is to generate too much stuff too much distraction, obviously too much food, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have allowed the food industry to make the food irresistible. And so, this, so something happened in the important and honorable and in fact, constructive phase of the initial promise. To the technologist, what should they consider? creating technology now? Well, let me stress here that you and Eric are, of course, heavily involved in technology. And you took the time to get up early, right? <laughs> and then you're taking time out of your uh, professional life to do this. And you're not the only ones, right? Now, you may have colleagues or former colleagues that said, oh my God, I'm making too much money, I'm out of here, you know, and then they become, I don't know, teachers or uh, nurses or gardeners, farmers. So there's hope. And uh, I, I'm really, I admire the two of you <laughs> for stepping out of your uh, professional life and worrying about what you're worrying about. So another way to phrase that might be, how do we keep technology human? Right. The important thing is that you can't do it by way of scolding and say, don't do this, don't do that. Oh my God, why? But have positive counterparts from which people can draw strength which is the other thing that gets them out of bed in the morning. One thing, of course, is, you know, got to go to work, got to pay the bills. And the other is, oh, this is going to be so wonderful this evening when the three, four or five of us are going to make dinner. Or, oh, this is going to be so wonderful this weekend when I get together with my friends and, and we play uh, New Orleans jazz. Right? Or I can't wait for our group of runners 
to meet well, perhaps today at, at, at noon, right? And, and we go running for an hour and, and talk to each other and, you know, see what the weather is like and the environment is like and so on. So there have to be these positive counterforces, the things that I call focal things, and then there have to be focal practices. You can't surrender the nurturing and inspiring power of a focal thing to one-time experiences. They have to be undergirded by a practice. So you regularly meet with your friends to do New Orleans jazz, and you get together every every noon with your friends with whom you run and so on. This is how the weather reform needs to be situated. What motivates you? Care for my beloved and uh, the focal things that I devote myself to. Which non-consensus views do you hold near and dear? The government is involved in shaping the context and the enforcers of the good life. That's a sorrow to me that even a good person like Biden doesn't see that. What or who has had the most impact on your thinking, career, or life? Two. One is John Rawls, who wrote the biggest, the most wonderful piece of philosophy produced by an American called A Theory of Justice. He was just a wonderful person, shaped the way I've learned to write. <laughs> and then the other is Martin Heidegger. I mean, we grew up in the same area. We went to the same high school. We went to uh, the same university and then lived in the same area. I tell people, you want to have a philosopher whom you can admire all the way down, don't take Heidegger. Take John Rawls or Martha Nussbaum. She's a, a wonderful philosopher. What are you currently reading? Measuring what counts. And who are your favorite writers or uh, podcasters? Paul Krugman, David Brooks, and Ross Gausset. They're very sensitive to what's going on in the culture. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.